Okay, so we are picking up today uh, in Matthew chapter 8, just real quickly, just about uh, a minute or two of review, just in the bigger picture of Matthew's gospel. So Matthew's gospel, one of the four gospels. Matthew's gospel belongs to a group of three of the four called the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, meaning that while they all tell slightly different stories to slightly different audiences, they tend to share some common terminology, some common perspective, and so that old word synoptic means same optic, right? Synonym, sin, optic, sight, so same sight. That Matthew, Mark, and Luke have a somewhat similar perspective, though different at the same time. Within Matthew's gospel, we know that Matthew's writing to a uh, Jewish audience, or at least uh, the Jewishness of Jesus and the Christian faith, very important to Matthew and to his audience. And we'll talk a little bit about that more this morning. We dive even deeper into Matthew's gospel, and we'll talk about, if you were here in the early weeks, we explored how for Matthew, if there was one single thing that he would want us to know about Jesus, if there's one single thing he would want us to grow in our understanding in, to grow in our capacity to grasp, it would be that for Matthew, Christ is king. Jesus is king. And much of Matthew's gospel is an expanding, an exploration, a deepening of understanding of what that means. And today is a new chapter, uh, a new dimension of Christ's kingliness. But we see this all the way back in the very beginning, Matthew chapter 1, where Jesus receives not one, but two names, remember? He's first named Jesus, his, his personal name, Yeshua, which means Yahweh saves. Yeshua, Yahweh saves. But then a little later on in Matthew chapter 1, he receives a second name, which again, remember, going all the way back to Genesis, names in the biblical text, incredibly important. In the ancient world, incredibly important. It was a way of revealing a person's character. It was a way of entering into intimate relationship, which is why names are important in Genesis, which is why it's so important in Exodus when Moses receives God's name for the first time. Names are incredibly important. So Jesus has not only one name, Yeshua, but then he receives his kingly name, his ruling name, which is Emmanuel, God with us. So we begin to see, even from the naming of Jesus, the character of who this king will be. He will be a king of salvation as well as a king of intimacy and relationship. And so then we launch from there into Matthew's gospel. Now Matthew's gospel is generally organized around five big sections of teaching. And I think I've got these on the screen behind me. These are sometimes called the five discourses of Matthew, the five discussions or teachings of Jesus, but five is important, right? Because again, for Matthew and his audience, the Jewishness of Jesus is important. Well, five, does that ring a bell for anybody? There are five books of the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the baseline for the Jewish faith. And so for Matthew, he envisions, he structures his gospel to draw our attention to the fact that Jesus has come fulfilling the law, that Jesus has come to bring about this expansion of their covenant relationship with God, that the people of God, those with whom and for whom God is in relationship, will continue to expand. So we just finished that first big discourse, which is the Sermon on the Mount, perhaps the most well-known to us. And as I mentioned, next week when Rick is here, we'll begin to dip our toes into the second, which is Matthew 10, the mission or missions discourse. But in between each of these teaching sections is this connective tissue of ministry of Jesus, where he goes from teaching us to showing us what the kingdom of God is like. And so that's exactly where we are going to be today. So I think that's a good primer for us. That's good context of sort of where we are and what we're entering into, that we are in this transition from the Sermon on the Mount to the missions discourse. And this is sort of the connective tissue in between them. Just to refresh us one last thing, the character of the king continues to unfold, right? 
So we get a hint in the very beginning that this is a saving king. Uh, This is an intimate king. We see going back to Matthew 4 and his engagement with Satan, the accuser. We see that Jesus is a warrior king. He does battle with us, alongside us, and for us. And then in the Sermon on the Mount, we see that Jesus is a wise king. And today, as we enter into this section on miracles, we see that Jesus is also a miraculous king. Or perhaps even better put, a powerful king. So, with all that rambling around in your head, let's jump into the biblical text this morning. I'm going to read for us Matthew chapter 8, verses 1 through 17, as uh, Matthew begins to expand upon and explore miracles uh, for the first time. There's going to be three different sections of miracles, three different encounters. We're going to, after we read all three and talk about them, we're going to uh, dive a little deeper on the middle section of uh, the faith of the Roman officer. All right, let me read for us. Matthew says that large crowds followed Jesus as he came down the mountainside. Suddenly, a man with leprosy approached him and knelt before him. Lord, the man said, if you are willing, you can heal me and make me clean. Jesus reached out and touched him. I am willing, he said, be healed. And instantly, the leprosy disappeared. Then Jesus said to him, don't tell anyone about this. Instead, go to the priest, let him examine you. Take along the offering required in the law of Moses for those who have been healed of leprosy. This will be a public testimony that you have been cleansed. When Jesus returned to Capernaum, a Roman officer came and pleaded with him, Lord, my young servant lies in bed, paralyzed and in terrible pain. Jesus said, I will come and heal him. But the officer said, Lord, I am not worthy to have you come into my home. Just say the word from where you are and my servant will be healed. I know this because I am under the authority of my superior officers and I have authority over my soldiers. I only need to say go and they go or come and they come. And if I say to my slaves, do this, they do it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed Turning to those who were following him, he said, I tell you the truth. I haven't seen faith like this in all Israel. And I tell you this, that many Gentiles will come from all over the world, from east and west, and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob at the feast in the kingdom of heaven. But many Israelites, those for whom the kingdom was prepared, will be thrown into outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus said to the Roman officer, go back home, because you believed it has happened. And the young servant was healed that same hour. When Jesus arrived at Peter's house, Peter's mother-in-law was sick in bed with a high fever. But when Jesus touched her hand, the fever left her. Then she got up and prepared a meal for him. That evening, many demon-possessed people were brought to Jesus. He cast out the evil spirits with a simple command and healed all the sick. This fulfilled the word of the Lord through the prophet Isaiah, who said, he took our sickness and removed our diseases. So this section, this collection of three miracle stories is uh, unique in several ways. And there's a few things I want to draw our attention to. Um, But first, I want to name the fact that miracles can be for us a a difficult topic to navigate, right? Because we are unsure of what our relationship to miracles should be. What, what should our expectations be? And uh, this is a, an important and kind of complex conversation and, and one that just in one morning together we can't fully explore together. But there's a few things I want to draw your attention to. One, I want us to be careful to not be too dismissive of miracles, Uh, For some of us, we may be inclined to think that, um, you know, miracles really is just uh, a name for something we don't understand, right? That it was a miracle because we can't explain it any other way. And perhaps there's some truth to that. 
But as Jesus says in John 14, 12, you will do the same things I have done and far greater because I am going back to my father and will be with him there. And so we need to be careful not to be too dismissive, right? That miracles was just something Jesus did or something in the ancient world or things like that. We need to leave open the possibility that miracles are possible, that there is something deeply true and right about them. And so some of the biblical text speaks to that directly, the miracles, the ministry that the people of God are called to do. Other portions of the biblical text when it comes to miracles will focus not on what the people of God will do, but what God himself does. And that's uh, our passages this morning belong to that second group. And so that's what I want to focus on this morning Uh, But I don't want to do it to the exclusion of that first conversation. And that's a conversation that we'll have together more in the future. Um, Because we need to leave open the possibility that um, God intervenes in meaningful ways, in miraculous ways, into our circumstances. And uh, that's very important. Matthew includes it here. But Matthew, I think, includes it here um, to tell us something even more deeply about who God is and how God works in the world and how we get to be a part of it. Make sense? So that's what I want our conversation to be grounded in this morning. Um, In each of these uh, sort of vignettes, I'll say, there's a couple things I want to draw our attention to, and then I want us to focus on the Roman officer. That um, the biblical text, if you're ever puzzled by it, if you don't know where to start, what to make of it, kind of even what's the point after reading it, there's uh, three questions that I would recommend to you. If you've ever read the biblical text and said, okay, I learned something, I learned part of the story, but what am I supposed to do with it? How do I apply it to my life? That if Jesus comes bringing abundant life and the word of God is the revelation of God, of Jesus incarnate in our life, then the biblical text should be working to expand and transform our life. But if you're like me, sometimes you can sit down and read the biblical text, and going from the page to our life seems like a pretty big jump, a pretty big journey for us to take. So there's always three questions that I ask, and I encourage other people to ask as well. The first is to say, what is the biblical text trying to tell me about myself and who God has made me to be? Next, what is God trying to tell me about himself? and what he is doing in the world? And third, what is God trying to tell me about the world he has made and the people he has placed in it? So put another way, what is the biblical text teaching me about myself, about God, and about the world in which I live? Chances are the biblical text, any portion, any verse, any translation is gonna be able to speak to you about one or even all of those things. And so those are the questions we're asking ourselves this morning. In each of these vignettes, we begin to see several things emerge about who Jesus is as he launches into the fullness of his ministry. What's most striking to me, and that's where I want us to start, is what kind of king begins to emerge from the story here, right? Who is Jesus in the midst of this? We'll notice that in each of these cases, the people that are coming to Jesus are fundamentally undesirable. Lepers, really the least desirable of all kinds of people imaginable. Basically, folks with infectious disease in an ancient world where nobody even understood what disease was. They were so outcast, so Uh, afraid, right? People were afraid of them, that the common practice, literally the law, was that if you were a person with leprosy, anytime you came into visual distance of anybody, you had to begin yelling at the top of your lungs, unclean, 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 everywhere you went, because you were viewed as a risk, as a danger to anyone and everyone unclean, unclean, unclean. You can imagine how, in pretty short order, your identity as a person begins to give way to simply that status. I'm not Scott anymore. I'm just unclean. Then you have the Roman officer, right? 
talk about the least popular of the least popular. Here is an officer, a leader in the army that has conquered your land, that has conquered Jesus' people. He represents the very worst things of the oppressor. Then finally, we move into uh, the home of Peter and his mother-in-law, right? Did you catch that, by the way? Important little detail, mother-in-law, Peter's married. Important little fun fact to know about some of the disciples. But that here is Jesus who begins to interact not only with a sick woman, which was, again, a sign of uncleanliness, but the fact that he engages deeply with a woman would have been revolutionary in the ancient world. As sad and unfortunate as it is to say, Jesus was likely, by many accounts, one of the first ancient teachers to incorporate women into his sphere of influence and teaching. But so that in each of these experiences and encounters, Jesus' miraculous work goes to those we might least expect. And so what begins to emerge in each of these vignettes and experiences is that the character of Jesus, right? That second question, who is God? Jesus' character begins to emerge. So let me put up three key characteristics for you that the king, as we begin to understand Jesus, not only now as the saving king, the intimate king, the warrior king, the wise king, but now the powerful and miraculous king, there are three things that each of these stories tell us about the character of God. The first is that the king is approachable. Don't take this for granted. That the character of Jesus is such that he is among the people. He is accessible to the people, even those who are deemed by society and community to be the lowest of the low. Our king, this king, is approachable and accessible. The second is that our king, in this case, in each of these cases, our king is undaunted, that he's not scared, he's not put off, he doesn't erect barriers or challenges, roadblocks for these people, but not only is he able to be approached, but when approached, he is unconcerned with the dangers of these people, the imperfections of these people. He's unconcerned with all of the things their community has become so concerned about. He is unconcerned with all of the things that their community has deemed unacceptable. It's not that he doesn't see them, it's not that he's ignorant of them, it's that he does not allow them to be a barrier between him and them. That our king is not only approachable, but he is unfazed by any hint of brokenness within them. And then third, equally as important as all of these, and that each of these moments, and this is what's so key for Matthew, that in each of these moments, by choosing to heal them, by choosing to restore them, because again, don't miss the fact that by healing and restoring each of these three people, not only are their immediate circumstances improved, not only is their illness taken away, but they are restored into the fullness of relationship. That God has not only healed their bodies, he has healed their whole life. Because in this ancient world, to be sick was to be cut off, not only from your body, but to be cut off from your family, to be cut off from your friends, to be cut off from your faith, to be cut off from your job. You were cut off. And the miraculous power of Jesus restores you, as we would say, from brokenness to wholeness across all dimensions there. And so Jesus emerges for us, approachable, undaunted, and we would say even inclusive that the boundaries of the community, who is inside and who is outside, are irrelevant for Jesus. Jesus is always looking to include more, to bring more into the sphere of the kingdom of God. Now again, it's not to say that Jesus is unconcerned with the covenant of God, because pay attention to what does he say to the leper? Don't tell anybody about this, but go immediately 
to the temple. Pay the tax, be declared healed, do it the right way. Jesus doesn't come in and blow up the faith, the origins, right, the covenant people. He comes in and expands it. He heals from within it. And then he begins to expand who all can belong and be part of the people of God. Now we could stop right there and say that's pretty good food for us to chew on. What kind of king do we follow? What kind of savior do we connect our eternity into? What does it mean for us to be the people of God in this way? It means that we're called to be the hands and feet of someone who's approachable who's unfazed and undaunted by the imperfections of others, who's looking to always include and expand the redemptive work of God in the world. There's plenty of uh, good work for us for this week or this year or this life in that regard. But there's a little bit more I want to draw our attention to this morning. Look with me again at the story of the Roman officer. In particular, let's look uh, just at verse 8 through verse 10. The officer has come. He is concerned about his young servant. Uh, Some of your translations may say his son. There's a little ambiguity there, but this is whoever it is. This is a very important young man in his life and definitely within his military family, whether it's biological or not. He comes and says, Jesus, will you heal him? A big risk, right? Because this is an oppressive man, right? An enemy, basically, of Jesus or Jesus' people. He comes, nevertheless, and says, will you heal him? Jesus says, I will come and heal him. But the officer says this, Lord, I am not worthy to have you come into my home. Just say the word from where you are, and my servant will be healed. I know this because I am under the authority of my superior officers. I have authority over my soldiers as well. I only need to say go, and they go, come, and they come. And if I say to my slaves and servants, do this, they do this. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed. Turning to those who were following him, he said, I tell you the truth, I haven't seen faith like this in all of Israel. This is to me going from uh, what does the text tell us about who God is to what does the text tell us about who we are called to be. This is, I think, where the real challenge is nestled into the gentle curvature of the text. Because we see that there are three things that the Roman officer has done. It really doesn't tell us a lot about him. We don't know where he's from, what his name is, even what his responsibilities are. We don't know much about the sickness of this. And yet, there is something about his response that has amazed Jesus. Not only something about his response that Jesus first agrees to heal this person, pretty remarkable in and of himself, but something that goes even further beyond that to amaze Jesus. And this is Matthew's uh, tip of the hat, actually, to the Sermon on the Mount. If you go back, you put your finger here and just go back to the end of chapter 7, right? How's the Sermon on the Mount end? It says that when Jesus finished talking, the crowds were amazed because he spoke as one who had power and not as their scribes, not as their religious leaders. And now what has happened? Someone on the outside, someone who doesn't even belong to the covenant people of God has come in, has recognized what? The power of Jesus at such a level, at such depth, that it has now amazed Jesus. We go from the power of Jesus amazing the crowds to Jesus himself being amazed that someone from the crowd has understood his power. See how that's happened? And so what begins to take place here is that this man recognizes there is some semblance of authority, that this is basically an officer somewhere in middle management, right? He's got those underneath him and he's got those above him. And he says, I understand how power works I understand how authority works. He says, you are a man of power, Jesus, and there is no one above you. He says, if I were to say to those underneath me, come and go, do this or do that, they do it. And I recognize, God, that you are a man of power, and if you say be healed, he will be healed. And it's at that moment, that same hour, that this man is healed. 
And so what we begin to do, much to our benefit, this Roman officer's behavior begins to give us a glimpse into how we as followers of God, as people of God, can come into the miraculous power of God. How we can come into contact with the miracles of God. And we see it across three different ways, three different elements. Each of these elements, though, achieves the same goal, which is that in this particular case, Matthew's gospel draws for us this important distinction that up until this point, when Jesus has gone to call his disciples, when Jesus has come to expand his sphere of ministry and influence, Jesus has gone out and called his disciples. But now something amazing is happening. And those who know and believe in Jesus are now coming to him to experience his miraculous power. That is a radical shift that has taken place in the gospel. That in order to experience the miraculous power of God, we have to go to God. Don't miss that. That up until this point, Jesus has been the instigator. Jesus has been the actor. But now it's begun to take place as miracles begin to emerge in the context of the gospel. It is people who are going and pursuing Jesus that intersect with God's miraculous power. That tells us something deep and true, not only about the character of God, but the character of who we are made to be. That if we want to sit here and say, God, come and do a miraculous work in my life. Come and do a miraculous work in this community, in this church, in this nation, in this world. Matthew's gospel would say, there's some responsibility for us in that. The miracles of God come when the people of God intersect with the power of God in the world. And the Roman officer gives us that blueprint of how to do it. Three quick things that I want to leave us with this morning and uh, give us a little bit of time to consider together as we, as we close and worship. That the Roman officer really does three things that lead to Jesus enacting this miracle in the world. The first is that he has compassion. This whole thing starts because he decides to care. That if he didn't care about this young servant in his house, if he wasn't bothered or troubled by it enough to even be emotionally stirred, much less to leave his job, to leave work and travel to go find this country carpenter, he's heard a few things about, none of this would have happened. He's moved by compassion for his servant that is sick. Next, he is moved towards humility. He comes to Jesus saying, teacher, I know who you are and I know who I am and you are far greater than me. I'm a pretty important guy, but I know I don't have what it takes that I don't have what this young man needs. So he moves from compassion to humility, and then finally to belief. He says, but I believe that you have the power. I believe you have what it takes. I do not, humility, honesty, clear-sightedness, but I believe that you do. And it is from that belief Right? Even if he just stopped at the humility, that he has compassion on his servant, God, can you come? I, I can't do this. Jesus says, I'll heal him. Don't worry about it. He says, no, no. He says, I believe something even deeper. I believe something even greater that you don't even have to come to my house, which I am not even worthy to receive you in. But I believe your power is so great your love so large that you can do it from right here. And Jesus is amazed at this man's faith. And it is each of those elements, compassion, humility, and belief that draws this man and his servant into the miraculous orbit of Jesus. And that man is healed and changed. 
So the way I read this this morning, I think part of our challenge for us this morning is that we are called and empowered. If we want to be people who see miracles, then we must inevitably be moved to journey towards Jesus. But to do so from a basis, from a foundation of compassion, humility, and belief. Whether it is for uh, a change in our own circumstances, healing in our bodies, transformation in our marriages, restoration in our parenting, change of circumstances in our work, right? To have compassion, humility, and belief. Or to do it on behalf of others, right? That's what's even more powerful. I don't think we could say this universally, but at least in these three cases, we get the impression that others have connected them to Jesus. As we talked about last week, others have priested them, bridged the gap, drawn them into deeper relationship with Jesus. And once there, Jesus' miraculous power and work takes over. So uh, my challenge for you and for us this week is that uh, we want to be the kind of people. I want us to be the kind of church that expects miracles to happen, that expects something far greater, far larger, far grander than we thought possible to take place, to take place in our church, to take place in our community, in our country, but to take place in our homes, to take place in our workplaces, to take place in the lives of those that we love, to take place in our own self. That something within us that is broken can be moved towards wholeness. For some part of us that is deemed unacceptable, undesirable, imperfect, wrong, bad, terrible, that Jesus moves us into wholeness. Redemption gentleness, inclusion. That is the basis of miracle. That is the grounding of miracles in our midst. And so for us to do that, there's much more conversation, right? There's much more to explore. What does it look like for us to be people, right? John 14, 12, to do the things Jesus has done and far greater. I believe that's possible. I believe we can do it. But I think an even better goal for us is to start where Matthew's gospel starts us to say, just bring people into the midst of Jesus. Do it with compassion and with confidence. Do it with humility. Do it with belief that when everything else isn't enough, Jesus may still yet be enough. That is the foundation for miracles. So here are my challenge for you. I'm going to ask our, our band to come back up and um, you can begin to think through and pray through this uh, this morning, to work through it this week. But my challenge to you is to work on one of those three elements this week in your life. Perhaps for you, you need to cultivate more compassion. You need to be interested in God's miracles impacting someone else besides you. Or perhaps you need to learn to grow, to take a risk, and to be compassionate with yourself. To aim for a miracle in your life, finally, before miracles come into everyone else. Perhaps for you it's cultivating compassion. Perhaps for you it's cultivating humility. Coming to terms with the fact that you really can't fix it. You can't plan your way out of it. You can't argue your way out of it. You can't save your way out of it. You can't work your way out of it. But there there has to come a moment, even for those of us with great means, great opportunities, great gifts, that like the Roman officer, a man of power and authority himself, he has to say, I am not enough. Finally, for you, perhaps it's just working on the belief Perhaps you're moved by compassion. Perhaps you don't have a problem with humility. You're feeling more powerless than ever, right? But for you, perhaps it's having God's help cultivating 
that miracles are possible, that healing is possible, that this relationship or situation is not too big for God, it's not been too bad for too long for God, but that with God all things are possible. So that's my challenge for you. That's your work this week. That if we want to take a step towards becoming a community of miracles, of people who see and participate in, who receive miracles, then it starts with those three things. So take one this week. And let's work on it together. As we get ready to end our time in worship, um, let me encourage you, if, if belief is your stumbling block, if that's where you're hesitant, if that's where you're not completely sold out, um, that's okay, you're not alone there. But one of the best remedies I have found for a lack of belief is to begin by cultivating memory. That oftentimes our lack of belief comes from a lack of memory in our life and our story. And that our capacity to envision a future where God moves and saves and redeems comes from our past experience of remembering how God has moved, saved, and redeemed us. And so as we get ready to close in worship today, church, my invitation to you is that you use this time to remember. Maybe it's just in your own mind or in prayer. Maybe it's taking notes on your phone or on a piece of paper in front of you. But as you go this week, as we wrap up our time in worship, my invitation to you is that you use this time to remember. Remember the ways that God has loved you. Remember the ways that God has saved you. Remember the ways that God has worked miracles large and small in your life. Because our ability to hope for the future comes from remembering 